This is the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast with Cass Midgley. We interview people you don't know about a subject no one wants to talk about. We hope to encourage people in the process of deconstructing their faith and help curb the loneliness that accompanies it. We think the world is a better place when more people live by sight, not by faith. Please subscribe to our podcast and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, you can support us monetarily in two easy ways. You can pledge one million dollars or more through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash EA podcast or leave a lump sum donation through PayPal at our website, everyonesagnostic.com. The smallest contribution is greatly appreciated. Welcome, everyone, to episode 224 of the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast. I'm Cass Midgley. I'm going to die. A big thanks to each and every one of our Patreon and PayPal supporters. My guest today is Ryan Bell. Ryan is a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor who became an atheist after an experiment where he took a year as a year without God. He's publicly spoken about his experience before, during, and after that year, and he wrote about it in his blog, Year Without God, hosted by Pathios. He's a regular contributor at the Huffington Post, and in August 2015, launched a new blog called Life After God. He currently serves as the National Organizing Manager for the Secular Student Alliance, an organization that empowers secular students on college campuses across the U.S. to proudly express their identity, build welcoming communities, promote secular values, and set a course for lifelong activism. Ryan is also the humanist chaplain at the University of Southern California. His story of gradual deconversion was covered by national and international news outlets, including CNN, NPR, the BBC, CBC, and LA Times. He received a Master's of Divinity degree from Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan and a Doctor of Ministry in Missional Leadership from Fuller Theological. Ryan is a writer, educator, and public speaker, and has expertise in subjects ranging from religion, intercultural communication, bioethics, and brewing coffee. Before we get into my talk with Ryan, I don't usually use this platform to make arguments for or against the existence of God. As the title exclaims, no one knows, and thus when it comes to whether a being started the Big Bang or is somehow involved in the affairs of life on Earth, no one knows. But it all very much smacks of human origin, human imagination and projection, All the theistic gods are far too anthropomorphic or human-like to be unknowable, unimaginable, ineffable. That's where I'd like to leave God as a mystery that is so ethereal that even if he, she, it exists, it doesn't make a difference. So at the end of the day, life is happening exactly as it would if there were no God. So let's just get on living it without God. In fact, the banner of the Life After God Facebook that I was looking up this week reads this, ended relationship with God. It was time. That's why some of us call ourselves apatheists, because who gives a fuck? I've often said that atheism is the best practice of theism, because if we got on with the reality of living life and the struggles of being human and stopped looking to the heavens for help or guidance— We'd fix our goddamn problems, which is what a good God would want. But I bring this up today because I was shocked by something this week that reminded me of the strength of the argument against the existence of God that is best known as the problem of evil. And as you know, I'm an unapologetic lover of what it means to be human. Sure, I could easily hate it, hate humans, and hate how hard my fucking life is, but then I'm left with contrasting that with the alternative, which is utter nothingness, unconsciousness, zilch, 
no experience whatsoever. So yeah, if I've got to be here, or should I say I get to be here, let's do this. Let's love one another and make the best of things. But because I know that day is coming when I will fade to black, I'm also learning what battles to pick, what's important, what's not, and for damn sure, God is not. And that's how I think she likes it. In that I love being human, most of all, I love orgasm. I love cold fried chicken, snow skiing, watching the final four, sorting out shit in my brain while mowing the lawn, Donald Fagan's music, and most of all, sex. I love the celebration of our bodies as the vehicle that carries us around and as playgrounds for each other's pleasure. I love it when people can be naked and not overly conscious of being naked. I love watching people fuck, all right? But a couple of times in my life, while exploring the internet for naked people enjoying themselves, I have accidentally stumbled onto some very horrific, tragic, despicable, evil shit. Shocking. The kind that is heartbreaking and utterly devastating to the poor soul that sees it and can't unsee it, but even more so, the real human being to which this inhumane treatment is being imposed. And that happened. That thing that I'm seeing, it actually happened. It's being videotaped. And I can't unsee it. So where my mind goes is it's happening right now, somewhere in the world, maybe thousands of places in the world. Bedrooms, hotel rooms, back rooms, locked basements, involving children even, sex trafficking and rape. It's all happening right now. And God ain't doing shit about it. Then my mind goes to the few times that my own cigarette has brushed against my arm and how quickly and surprisingly painful that is and how some parents do that on purpose to their own children and God does nothing. And there's thousands of parents out there that I don't think have any business being a parent and the unfairness of innocent children being introduced into a world that they didn't have any say in entering to parents they didn't choose, and to bodies they didn't choose. Who we are on earth is a total lottery. No justice to it whatsoever. I have a nurse friend who worked in a children's hospital for years before it took a toll on her, and she had to change careers. Right now, as we speak, countless unspeakable evils are happening to millions of people. Out of the seven billion, that's not a stretch. As we speak... Millions of people are screaming in horror and pain. Hell, this week, Saudi journalist Jamal Khazaghi was said to have been murdered by dismembering him while he was still alive. And it's said to have taken him seven minutes to die and probably with no limbs. I don't know, but I'm just saying God did nothing. And it happens every second of every day and for 200,000 years. Historically, this is the least violent century in human history. Unimaginable evil has happened every second of every day around the world for over 200,000 years. And if any of us were all powerful, even as unloving and selfish as we are as humans, compared to the alleged all-knowing, all-loving character of God, we would have done something or gone insane. And yet God does nothing. Any of us would have been a better God than that and put a stop to it. Even if it meant putting a stop to all life, fuck it, we'd do it to stop the screams and suffering and injustice. We'd at least scrap this fucking disaster and start over with a better plan. So yeah, there is no God in this God-forsaken universe. It's just us here. I got behind a car this week with a bumper sticker that said, Protected by angels, and I just wanted to ram it just to show how delusional, childish, and cowardly that mindset is. Wake up. That kind of stupidity and magic thinking is why these same evangelicals elected one of the worst specimens of a human being on the planet to the highest office on the planet. Because God. God's going to save us, and he's going to use the weak things of the world to confound the wise. 
those liberals, those smarty pants, educated libtards. We'll show them with Trump. They think they can solve our problems with getting smarter in education and science and thinking and working together and cooperating and caring. All those good things are just filthy rags to God, a God who wants glory, who wants to show off. And the more incompetent the human being is that God uses, the more credit God gets. This is not a game. This is not make-believe. We're here, we're real, evil is real, and humans are doing it. And if we're going to make this world tolerable, it will be humans that fix it. Because the only thing that stops a bad man with a god is good people without one. We taped this conversation on October 8th, 2018. The intro music is by Dave Weckl, called Just Groove Me. The segue music on this episode is titled Dudes by David Mead. You can learn more about Ryan Bell and his work at lifeaftergod.org or their Facebook site, Our Life After God. Thanks for listening, and be a yes-sayer to what is. Hey. Hello. What's up? Here I am. (laughs) Good to see your face, man. Long time no see. I know. It's been a long time. Where are you calling from? I forget where you live. Pasadena, California. All right. You like it there? It's good. Yeah, it's good. What's what's the temp? Oh, man, today is so nice. It's like in the 60s. Oh, shit. Low 70s. Yeah, it's great. Well, we were in about the mid-80s today, but it's it's humid and yuck, yuck, yuck. Well, so I'm encouraged by your work. I always have been. I mean, we hooked up. God, when was your year without God? That was uh, 2014, <laughs> almost four years ago when I started that. Right. So I think it was after after the tail end of that, somehow I got you on and we, we talked and I went to your... Um, Open house or what was it? Oh, the launch party. The launch life party. After God. Yeah, yeah, for Life After God. You went from Year Without God to LAG, which has been a very, I would <laughs> say it's been a very beneficial organization for a lot of people. Yeah, you know, and it's as I've gone from being unemployed to employed, at t- you know. Off and on. A time or two. <laughs> yeah, you know how it goes. Um, I've had more and less time to put into it. Um I'm just getting ready to start up a new sort of season of the podcast. So uh, I've been, you know, getting some things in order and making sure I've got some good things lined up. So it's been a little bit quiet, but we're we're getting ready to come back. I'm encouraged by your work because the thing that you started is kind of self-propelling or something. Like, yeah, you've been busy. You've been in and out. But here's what's cool. Unlike ministry, where it's a cult of personality, centers around a charismatic leader, this thing just goes like, and I'm, I guess mostly I'm sp- specifically talking about the Facebook site. Um, th- right. Those people really love and encourage one another on a regular basis with or without you. Yeah. You know, and Brian Peck has a lot to do with that. Absolutely. He really stepped up early on and, and said, you know, like, let me make some memes, you know, to go along with your <laughs> uh, podcast. <laughs> you know, just to kind of help advertise the shows. And mm-hmm. he was really responsible for taking the Life After God, the official Life After Facebook page, the public one, from like 2,000 followers to like now over 10,000 followers, 11,000 followers. So he's really done a lot. And now he's doing his own thing and putting less time into yeah. uh, into Life After God, which is great. I mean, because he's doing some good stuff with his organization, Room to Thrive, yep. which is, you know, really hands on therapy coaching for people that are going through faith transition but he's really uh been great and i had a team of moderators that helped me with the the private group and you know the private group honestly could grow so much faster if i didn't make it private but i've really you know we have to deliberately add a person um right i have the same thing time we add someone to the yeah it's a bit of work because you, sometimes people recommend someone to the group What's your story? Because you kind of want to make sure that 
people aren't just kind of infiltrating to cause problems. And to be fair, I've never had any of that. We've never had any sort of like troll believers trying to get into the group. Yeah. Or any trolls or anything like that. So it's been good in part because we have been careful. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. But it's a lot of work just to maintain that side of things. And then to try to keep it from being, um, you know, a Christian bashing forum yep. or, you know, and then and then we've tried to say, like, you know, in, in the early stages, people are a bit more pissed off about being lied to or being feeling deceived or abused, outright abused by by religion. And they are angry and they want to ex- have a safe place to express that anger. And people that have moved on from that a little bit maybe don't appreciate it so much. So everybody's in a different place. And you yep. have to give <laughs> what I would have said in the past. We have to give grace, you know, to people. Right. To, yeah. allow them to be where they are and sort of remember that we were once at a different place and, yep. Yep. and try to be, be uh, understanding. Yep. And that, that's just community in a nutshell. That's the, the difficulty of human cohabitation. <laughs> yeah. If, if nothing else, I think Christian community and Christian ministry really did help me think of people in a generous way and, and yeah. try to meet them where they are and even if they're like maybe annoying to me just as a, as a, you know, as a human, I'm annoyed by them. But, you know, as a Christian minister, I was like, well, my job is to like meet them where they are and help them grow and help them um, find friendship and welcoming and all of that. Yeah. And I think I did that to a fault to where I, <laughs> I was more focused on other people than I was focused on myself. But I don't regret having learned those skills because I feel like the secular community really lacks that, Yep. you know, um, and they really want, it's like almost a higher level of conformity sometimes is required. Yeah. Well, that that brings up a subject that actually I want to table, because, but we'll come back to it. I'm going to write a note here. The atheist movement, quote unquote. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but what came up just then, okay, dealing with people, and I'm reading a book. I just had a guy on last week. And- a good podcaster would read the book before the interview, <laughs> but he came on and I ended up reading his book afterwards. Well, mostly because I was so impressed, which would be the point, right? To have him on in a way that people listen to go, oh, I got to get that book. Well, that's the effect he had on me. <laughs> hmm. And uh, I listened to, it was a guy named Andy Chaliff, and he wrote a book called The Last Letter. And it's kind of an eat, pray, love, because um, hmm. he, he ends up going to s- seven different continents or uh, maybe all seven or no maybe not all seven but anyway he just travels he's trying to his his mother was killed in a car accident when he was seven 18 and he just wanted to run and run away from his pain and it's all about him getting in touch with his pain which i think is the hot topic right now uh and that is grief and 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 how we deal right. with grief and i know that a lot of times it's always in the context of a loss of a loved one and death or a breakup and a romantic relationship. But now we're seeing it, you know, superimposed over the loss of God and the loss of that thing and, and the grief process. And there's a lot of theories out there. And this was, this was good. And I'm listening to the book. Anyway, the point being is that he's, I'm so inspired. And you know, this, you get this when you, when you read good people, when you read their stuff, whether it's poetry or prose or, or mm. m- memoir or, you know, just anything, their vibe, their personality comes through. And like, if I'm in the car on an audio book and I'm done with my commute and I kind of have to turn it off in mid, you know, chapter, I get out of the car and I can kind of feel myself feeling a vibe that I get from Mm. that author. And it could be like negative, like I'm all anxious or I'm hateful or I'm mean or, you know, it's made me a, it's made me mad or something. As opposed to, oh my gosh, I love the, I love myself, I love humanity. I mean, it's like a high, and that's what this book did right. for me. So when you were talking about dealing with people in your church, there's a couple things going on. You know, there's a difference between judgment and assessment, and I really, I really need to emphasize this for anybody who thinks I'm judgmental because I am, but it's mostly because I'm assessing people. And I'm assessing, I, I'm a, I'm, I want to be a person that I get to choose my life. I get to choose my friends. I'm a, I want to be a person of boundaries. And if I don't find you interesting, I'm not saying you're evil. I'm not saying you're an asshole. I'm just saying I don't want to spend time with you, and that's okay. Yeah. And I think we weren't allowed that kind of uh, assessment when we were Christians. Right, you know? love everybody. It, it, yeah, you had to sort of love everybody and 
fit everyone in somehow. Like even if they were like consuming, you know, 50% of your time, you know, they, they had to be somehow part of it. I finally got to the place when, before I left the church where I was, you know, I had established for myself some boundaries where I felt people were, you know, harming the community. And I sort of found a way within myself to be okay with cutting them loose, letting them go. Yeah. I still struggle with this when it comes to ideological issues, you know, where I only have so much time to read and I only have so much time to educate myself about what's going on in the world. And as much as I would like to know, you know, I was just saying to my girlfriend the other day, like, I really am kind of obsessed with these like right wing <laughs> hate groups and, and kind of what makes them tick. And I try, it's so against my nature to, to think in the, in the way that those groups do that I'm sort of obsessed with figuring out, like not figuring out, I suppose, but under, trying to understand what makes people go that route. Mm -hmm. But I only have so much time. And if I fill my head with that all the time, I, you know, I'm not putting other things in, into my knowledge that I, that I need to have. So. Right. And, and that's just the finite nature, but I will commend you for this. And I don't, I think this might've been Stephen Covey, but seek first to understand and second to be understood. Yeah. And, and I mean, if, if the world's going to change, if, if people are going to get along better, and if this chasm that America is under is going to start to come together, it's going to be because that very attitude. I'm, I'm curious as to mm -hmm. how these motherfuckers got to this place because I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that unless they're a psychopath, which is possible, but it's probably 1% of the human race or something, I don't know, or a sociopath, right. which might be more like 5 or 7%. <laughs> but other than that, they're doing their best, and they actually, most of them, think, I know this to be true, of, of certain you know white supremacists that I've read about or, or heard interviews with, they literally believe that they're doing the right thing, not only for the whites, but for the blacks. Right. They think they're being loving. And right. I think Westboro Baptist thinks they're being loving. Yeah, I have a hard time figuring that out. Like, do you, like with people, especially the public figures, you know, people like like Ben Shapiro, for example, who came to USC the other day. Yeah. Like, does does he believe what he's saying, or is it a, is it a game to him? He's definitely book smart. So there's a part of me that's like, he must know that what he's saying isn't true. <laughs> in a certain, I'm thinking of a, like a particular sentence that he says, and I'm like, yeah. well, that's not true. He must know that. But he's playing off of that to sort of rile up his fans. So I, I don't know. I always have a hard time because I never want to believe bad faith about people. But there right. are, you know, especially online, there's so much bad faith communication that it's hard to know even where to begin. Yeah. Um, because if, if you assume that you're conversing with someone in good faith, you're, there's a good chance you're wrong about that. <laughs> and that you'll waste a lot of energy and breath earnestly engaging with someone about something. And then you realize, oh, they're they're not even working at this they're just playing around yeah i i know that we're talking like this is a charlatan you know televangelist with these some of these guys absolutely know that they are literally just making money off these credulous old ladies and that's just tough luck that's on them you know that they should have been yeah. more skeptical or something and so and the life is short and let's just you know, I don't know what goes through these heads, but I think I think people like Alex Jones on Infowars absolutely. I I, mm. I used to think it about Rush Limbaugh. I I I just believed that they knew exactly what they were doing. It was a role that they played, almost like Colbert when he did his show. It was a role, you know. Except everybody right. knew it was a role, and it was clear that it was a role, and he was mocking, you know, the opposite. These guys, I don't know. I just right. think there's something there, and so. When you go to, you know, like you're saying, when you went out to, to hear Shapiro talk, it's like, what? That's, I mean, come on. No, come on, you can't, you can't believe that. You know, I know, it's crazy. <laughs> you're smart enough to know that you, you're, you're, you know, and, and you know, there's something about this might be a, a derailment, but <laughs> my wife tells a story about a friend of hers, and there's something about being really sweetly, uh, kindly benefit of the doubtedly a believer in your friends and just a believer and just come to the table. Mm. And this is, this is kind of vulnerable, right? Like if you come guarded, 
That's the opposite of vulnerable. So it's a loving thing to do to be engaging with somebody where, where you're actually engaging. Like you just said, when you're talking to those people, they're not really there. You're engaging and they're just literally still playing a game with your head. Anyway, this friend of hers told a story. It was a really sad story to the point where, and I'm, we're talking teenagers, uh, to where mm. it made Mindy cry. Like, literally, she was like, oh, my gosh, that's so sad. I'm so sorry that happened to you. And then the girl literally went, I just made it up, and, like, mocked her. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Right? It's like a stab to the fucking heart. And what a betrayal of of trust. And that's what we're talking about. It is cruel. And that's why I think Alex Jones is cruel. I think anybody, if Shapiro knows what he's doing... Just, you know, I don't know. It's, it, this is a fucked up world now. So these are the, this is a sociopath thing though to me. That would be sociopathic because I'm wanting to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. I'm wanting to say everybody's fighting their own battle and everybody's doing the best they can. And that's just not true sometimes. And I hate that. (laughs) Well, and I, I should probably say too that I, you know, especially Twitter gets me sucked in sometimes. And there are, you know, there have been more than one occasion when I've, you know, gotten pulled into that re- rhetoric too of uh, argumentation in bad faith or oh, just yeah. trolling a little bit. And there's a little bit of a seduction to trolling and, and you realize you got someone on the ropes and you just kind of play with them a little bit. And so, but I, I really have, and my, my girlfriend holds me accountable too. Like I try not to do that too much because I think it's bad for the overall discourse. And, um, I mean, I don't know if Twitter's redeemable at all, yeah. but Oh, sure general, it is. Well, I think it's bad, bad for the discourse, you know, when when we're not taking each other seriously or taking the issues seriously. Yeah. And there's I don't know, there's something to hide behind. Right. I mean, there's, it's not face to face. So there's something non intimate. Right. Uh, which could embolden people, you know, to a point where it's not really real. Yeah. I, I see you and I always have since the day, first time I ever saw you in any kind of interview situation as like the year without God, or even when I had you on, I've always known, because I'm, I am so much of an immature version of a 52 year old that it's really like, there's a lot of arrested (laughs) development going on here, you know? (laughs) And I see people like you, you're, and you're probably what, 10, what are you, 45? Four, I just turned 47. Okay. All right. So you're, what is your, your, a, your, wait, five years. Yeah. You're only five years younger than me. Five years, yeah. But I see you as just so much more mature, and you take the high road, and you're you're highly intellectual, and I I see you as a person of integrity, and but I have seen you in the last I think in the last month, I have seen you say things on Twitter that I went, whoa, Ryan is getting riled <laughs> up here, you know. Uh, oh man! It was a little oh, no. bit out of character. I mean, it's not a bad thing because your character's so goddamn high. But it was enough to where it was like, "Whoa, he's really somebody's got under his skin." And well, we should. This is fucked up. What's happened to our country? I mean, there's some stuff here that is very worthy of rage. Is it not? Yeah, I I think that the context is extraordinary. Um, Unbelievable. At least in my lifetime and our lifetime, you know. And I, I'm not saying that anything that we're going through right now is any worse than what other people have gone through and certainly for people of color and for women it's it's been <laughs> yeah. far far worse you know and i hate to even use the, those sort of comparative terms of better and worse because, right right There's you know no we point. all experience the world as we experience it and you know it's you know so what if you know your grief is a little bit worse than mine i mean mine feels like grief too so yeah um it's not so a anyways, competition that being yeah it's not a competition but that being said we are in extraordinary times i think we can all agree and I think even people on the right would would probably feel there's just this polarization and it's affected all kinds of different communities. Um, and I guess I expected it in the Christian community. Like I was on the left in the Christian community and I came out of Christianity, I think, mistakenly thinking that secularism and rationality and free thought would be more – well, more rational and or more, <laughs> more liberal or more progressive. And I think in general it is. But I think in the last few years, we've really seen some uh, fissures open within the skeptical movement or in the in the free thought movement in as, in as much as there is even a movement. And of course, everybody wants to debate about whether there is such a thing and, yeah. and all of that. But 
Um, what I do know for sure is that we'd have these organizations that are, you know, formal organizations that, that organize like my own organization that I work for around principles of secularism and freedom of speech and freedom of, um, expression and religion and all of that, um, yeah. that it's been challenging. You know, we've been, we've been rocked by the same sort of sexual assault scandals that everybody else has. We've been, you know, inundated with, if not outright, alt-right types of rake, at least, you know, pandering or, yeah. or uh, platforming that, that type of ideology, um, race realism, and kind of some, some at least racist adjacent types of uh, rhetoric, and all kind of in the name of like, we all just need to have a debate of all these ideas, and let's all just calm down and talk about, you know, whether black people deserve to live, you know, like, that, <laughs> that's like, and I'm like, no, we shouldn't talk. We that's not a subject that I'm interested in discussing. That's that's not to me. That's a once and done. Like you think about that for one second, and you think, no, no of course they are. You know that that was a thing that was uh, solved yeah. at least for most people decades, centuries ago. Yeah, yeah. Why are we talking about so, this? So yeah, why why and, and in the name of sort of edginess or or like, well, I'm not afraid to approach any subject um and i don't think for me it's about fear of approaching a subject it's it's simply that the subject is is closed it's almost like you know double jeopardy in a way like in a court of law you can't be tried for the same crime twice you know if you were acquitted or if you were at least found not guilty that's it it's over yeah. um unless new evidence emerges right if someone finds the smoking gun you know 5 years later and they're like ah you know now we can retry this person with the new evidence. And, you know, from the time I started into this journey, there have been people talking about how, you know, Bill and I shouldn't have debated Ken Ham because it just gives Ken Ham a platform, a platform yeah. and a justification or a kind of, um, it sort of gives a, a, a false sense that what Ken Ham is doing is science. And when it's not science and to debate him in, on the basis of science is, uh, you know, giving him too much credit. So, this is, you know, to bring up sort of genetic race science, for example, that's been debunked, you know, a couple decades, several decades ago as some kind of edgy thing that we all need to now talk about if we're really committed to free speech is just ridiculous to me. And it doesn't serve any good purpose. Mm -hmm. But I, I definitely have let my frustration get the better of me at times. And well, um, shock is not really the word. It was just a little bit up from from your norm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it was good. I was. It was kind of fun. I was like, okay, he's human. <laughs> well, and I'm also trying to very sincerely, like, I'm trying to evaluate what my role is. You know, so I don't. It's easy for me as a you know privileged person, a cisgendered, you know, straight white male, middle class, all the rest, to sort of sit back and let the world burn down around me because I'm going to be the last one to catch fire pretty much. Yeah. It, that's, <laughs> that's a great that's question cool. though cuz I know that we sometimes feel reluctant to jump in and even as allies because sometimes we get we do ally wrong. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. And I do ally wrong all the time and yeah. I think any purported ally that doesn't think they get it wrong a lot is just not not being a very good ally. aware enough yet. <laughs> right, and I've been there. I know that, and I've, I, I'm I'm a crappy ally a lot too. I'm I, in ways that I'm not even sure I'm aware of right. until someone tells me. But I mean, that's the thing about being blind or being limited. Yeah. And we're all limited. But the thing about being a limited human being is that we don't know what we don't know. Or yep. We can't see what we can't see. We can't see our blind spots. That's the definition of blind spots. <laughs> blind spot, so right. you need other people to come alongside you and say, hey. You know, from my perspective, which is different than yours in X, Y, Z ways, uh, you know, your behavior in this way to me indicates such and such. And you have to be a person that's at least somewhat open to hearing that type of stuff. And, Absolutely. And I don't know that we all are. And, and I'm not always open to that. You know, I, I get defensive as much as anybody else. <laughs> but I think that we have to you know, be willing to stick our necks out as well and be willing to be wrong. And I think, you know, one uh, a white woman who's in this work, that, you know, anti-racism and anti-sexism work, you know, told me, she's like, look, you need to get over your anxiety about getting it wrong. You're going to get it wrong. So let's just settle, settle that right now. You're going to get get it wrong. 
you're going to say the wrong thing. You're going to do the wrong thing. And that's just how it is. And yeah. you need, need to just, you know, toughen up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and don't so let that paralyze you. Yeah. And, and, but also to leave, like in the case of like, say sexual assault or whatever, to leave women out there to do all the battle for equality is, is not fair. And, and to leave people of color out there to do all the work. I mean, this is the whole thing around the organization Surge, uh, you know, which is white people organizing for anti-racism. And racism is a white problem, and white people need to do the heavy lifting on that issue. And um, misogyny and sexism is a male problem, and the men men need to do the work. It's so deep-seated in our culture, man, because... Like, I know that one of the things that I've heard as far as what a white guy, or not just a white guy, just a guy, in the case of assault or, or something, and just they're saying, okay, when there's locker room talk going on, to quote our president, uh, right. you, as as an ally, an advocate, you need to say something. Say, hey, let's not talk about her like that, you know, or something like that. And I get right. that. And a part of me says that's, it, it, I, I don't know, it smacks of censorship. And let's let's cover this up when the the it's kind of a band aid when it's much deeper than that. Like this person has been raised by their own father to see women a certain way. So us asking him to stop talking that way just sends it underground. I don't know. Yeah, it's not so much about stopping talking that way or just being quiet. It's more about raising awareness about it, you know, yeah. and to say, you know, that thing you're saying, we've heard it all our lives, haven't we? We grew up that way, didn't we? Yeah. And we, we've always talked like that, haven't we? We've all done this, haven't we? <laughs> but what it is, is can you see how it's contributing to like the fucked upness of everything? Like that's, right. this is it. This is the seed of this thing that grows into Donald Trump. And it's not just shut up, stop saying that, but let's all just kind of like think for a minute about <laughs> would we say that with the person present? And if not, why wouldn't we? And is that what we really think about women and if so that's something else you yeah. know that we need to really yeah. look into well good point you just you just uh, that's a free podcast everybody just got a free tidbit there for no i'm serious i <laughs> I, I got that i got that um so back when we were talking about the movement the atheist movement and how disappointing it you know some of us had we thought okay we're out of the church and we're going to be these we found our new tribe and our new peeps and and it can be disappointing when you realize, oh, it's the same here. It's the same, you know, and wherever there's humans. I know I like to quote this Jesus quote where it says, where two or more are gathered, there I am. And I want to say something mm. along the lines of, where two or more are gathered, shit's going to happen. I mean, this is, we're, we're, right. we're a mess. And I yeah. think about our, our, our buddy Bart Campolo, and he talks about tribalism yeah. in a way that he's like, hey, it's, yeah, tribalism can be evil because it's mob mentality, it's strength in numbers, it's feeling superior because you're with these people and those people. And it's what well, my favorite Dr. Seuss book is The Star Bellied Sneetches, which is all about superiority over somebody <laughs> who doesn't have a stars on bars. Whereas Bart tries to salvage the, the notion that we're social creatures and that we are going to migrate or be uh, magnetized to certain people and there's nothing wrong with that because actually even now is going back to my reference to grief the grief book that i'm reading at now which is called the handbook on grief i think the prescription there is don't do this alone is mm. share your pain out loud with another person and have them share their pain with you i mean so we know the prescription of community and fraternity and love and and but we also know that that's probably going to be maybe five or six people in your life at best <laughs> right so and i think as we get older too i mean i i remember hearing parker palmer talk about this i think it was parker palmer or it might have been henry now and yeah either way you know about getting older and needing fewer people in your life to validate you yep and you know when you're young you you surround yourself with people that make you feel good about yourself. And then, yeah. again, that, that sounds like a judgment the way I just said that, but it's not really. That's just reality. We all do it. That's just reality. And then as you get older, hopefully, if you're growing up and becoming more mature, you're more comfortable being who you are regardless right. of who endorses you. That, you know, to have a couple of good friends in your life who you don't have to explain every goddamn thing <laughs> you're talking about. You don't have yeah. to justify every weird emotion that you have yeah um you know is great like you have a couple people 
And, and as you were saying that, I was thinking the same thing. Like, I think we misplace our loyalties in like heroes or figureheads or people at this sort of global scale, you mm-hmm. know? So we yeah. have this atheist movement and who are the figureheads in atheist movement? Well, maybe it was Richard Dawkins or maybe it was Sam Harris or something. And then they say something that really is maybe kind of cruel and maybe they didn't even mean it that way or they did. It was a poorly chosen expression or, or maybe that really is truly who they are. And it disappoints us. And we think, well, that's not my hero. And well, now what am I going to do? You know, now we're right back where we were before. And the reality is like every time I travel, the thing that gives me hope, like I was just in Kansas city and I was with the Kansas city Oasis crew. And I was like, wow, this is a great little group of people. And I'm sure there's, and it's not that little, actually, there's a couple hundred people there. And I'm sure I would find plenty of things to disagree with them about different ones of them. But it's not like they're all marching to the same beat and they're all on the same page, but in that local small community, you can find a family or two, a handful of friends, and that's your community. Yep. And and then if someone turns out to be a monster, then they're not in your community anymore. Yeah. So yeah. you just have to manage it like that, I think. Yeah. I you know, when we got here, it was it was hard because of like we didn't have any roots here. And I know at one point my wife said, you know, we could leave here tomorrow and I wouldn't shed a tear. And that was a derogatory, you know, that was mm. you know. And so in order to have some roots, you know, I I I was proactive. I literally sought out some people. I solicited them to be in a book club. Uh, yeah, that we never read a book. <laughs> no, no, we did. <laughs> but it was that was it was really just an excuse to get together where it didn't sound so creepy. <laughs> when wow, you're yeah. when you're sending out that email of saying, "Hey, you got, we're lonely." <laughs> Would you would you be my friend? <laughs> right, right. But like, it, it's beautiful when yeah, it, when Mr. it works. Mister Rogers. Yeah. Well, and speaking of Mister Rogers, be my neighbor. You, you talk about the, the, You know, there's. Did you see the movie, the doc- documentary? I did. I did. And yeah. is that not just the anti-Trump? <laughs> yeah, you know, he was a man out of time. You know, it felt like I felt like he's certainly not a man of our age. But I wonder if he was even a man of his age. Like he. He, was he so- did his own thing. And I think even as I watched, I used to watch that show all the time as a kid. And mm-hmm. I just, I even think I had a sense that it was a little corny or whatever, like even as a kid. Yeah. But he didn't care. Like he didn't care if nope. it was corny. He didn't care if it was dorky. He had a mission that he was going to teach kids to get along with each other and be kind and yep. and forgive each other and help each other out. And that was his mission. Yeah, and what a breath of fresh air he he was. That movie, or that documentary was was amazing. Uh, just just one example. I think there was something that had something very racist that had hit the news, and you know he was he just had such a huge tender heart for for loving one another and and accepting people that are different. And way before his time, um, you know, he saw that racism and he just disgusted him and. And he does an episode where he's, I guess it's a hot summer day, and he's got this little mini plastic pool for children, and he's taken off his shoes and socks and rolled up his pant legs and put his feet in it. And a a friend of his comes by, and it's a black man, and he says, hey, you want you put your feet in here? And the camera focuses straight <laughs> straight down on their feet next to each other in that pool because actually that's what it was it was i think they were afraid there were people that wouldn't swim in the same pool with black people right exactly yeah he had these very prophetic ways of without even addressing it directly because he knew he was talking to children yeah he undermined it by his own <laughs> behavior like to say i'm going to swim in the same pool as this man yeah and if anybody gets upset about that, well, too bad you know <laughs> like yeah. that's that's the message I want to get across. I imagine that's the Jesus that you and I liked the it's not it's not yeah. undermine it's not usurp what's the word that we used for Jesus as he kind of spoke truth like to a power? subversive like subversive it was, that's it I mean I think he was sort of like I, whenever I think of subverting something, I think of like going under the foundation of a building and sort of without anybody noticing like cutting away the dirt under the foundation until one day all of a sudden the building Sinkhole. falls down and nobody, nobody, know, nobody knows why like why the building fall down um you know and jesus was just slowly like undermining yeah. the authority of the religious and political leaders of his day but just in these very like subtle ways that 
it's almost that expression, that biblical expression to him that has ears, let him hear, you know, yeah, like yeah. for those that don't have the eyes for it, they'll just miss it, you know? And yep. that was according to the text, at least the style that he, that well, he employed. And yeah, no, I didn't plan on going here, but I, I think that it's worth saying, and I know that, you know, the people that listen to your show and mine, we sometimes need to give ourselves a break because there was, there was a lot of good reasons to not only believe in Christianity, but to stay mm. in it for decades. And you just gave a couple. I yeah. think where, where you were going with that, for those who have ears to hear, the next thing I think of is his advice to not waste your breath on people that aren't really ready to hear it. When the, when the student's ready, the teacher arrives, and that student's not ready, so don't cast your pearls before swine. That's just good fucking advice. Yeah, and he was he was uh, you know, and again when I say he, um, you know, to the to the <laughs> whatever this out there like this caricature that the was he created. I'm referring to is the uh, yeah the person of the literature right the yeah. person of the King Arthur of the biblical story as it were yeah um, you know was a was a person who was kind and gentle what was the 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 phrase of the prophet Isaiah was something like the the bruised reed he would not crush a smoking yeah. flax he would not extinguish it was like he was very gentle to the bruised and broken yeah. people and, and to he, the power of his heart. Yeah. You know, like he, he dealt out his, his, his lessons and his like teaching in different ways to different people. Yeah. And, you know, he's not this meek and mild guy. Sure. If you're like a prostitute who's been hauled out naked before a mob and threatened with being stoned, of course he's going to be gentle and kind to that person. But to the people who drug her out there, Yep. He's going to be harsh to them, yeah. you know. So I think it was that's that's a, a good a good model. Yeah, well and it, and why wouldn't it be because it's literally the best of of that generation's human imagination and just projected onto a screen. You know, I I, yeah. I think whenever uh if I have a thought that I that I think is just really profound. I I did this when I was a kid and I was afraid to say it. At my, I'm talking about at my dinner table with my parents. I'm like maybe t- 10 or 11 years old. And I wanted right. to, I wanted to roll it out. I wanted, you know, I wanted to introduce it to see everybody's reaction, but I didn't want it to come from me in case they hated it or thought it was stupid. And so I would say, I would always say to my friend, you know, that whole thing, you know, I'm, I'm asking for a friend. But in this, <laughs> but in this case, I was saying, you know, my friend said something at school today and I was testing it out on them. And I, I think right. that there were, I think we can say, I don't know. I don't know what we can say, but let's just say there was no Jesus and he's literally just the amalgamation or the patchwork of a, uh, you know, almost um, a Frankenstein creation of a lot of different people's imaginations and projections and, and philosophies and, and axioms. I mean, they're just, they're saying stuff and it just ends up over time getting attributed to Jesus. Yep. You know, and the point being is that some of it was good shit. That's all I'm trying to say is we've got to yeah. cut ourselves some slack. Yeah, there's some good stuff in there mixed in with some bad stuff. And Absolutely. What? Imagine that. Some, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Written and by I, humans. I of, we do have this desire, don't we, for a kind of silver bullet, whether it's with philosophy and ethics or whether it's with political leaders. We want We want that president that we could elect that would really take us to the promised land <laughs> to use a another biblical metaphor <laughs> here we go um but there's no president like that there's no there's no king that we could crown that would solve all of our problems we have to solve our problems i yeah. mean to me this is the message of of socialism of of real true democracy which is people rolling up their sleeves and solving their problems collectively together and in a way that is that is fair and, and equitable. So uh, yeah, I, I think we always lust after that, that leader who will uh, f- fix it for us. And right. And sorry guys, there's, there's, there's nobody like that. <laughs> and that's kind of, it's, it's not me. No, <laughs> hell yeah. Hell no. That, that's kind of what we're saying about the cult of personality that when we have these heroes uh, and then they disappoint and, you know, yeah. way too much um, gravitas or, you know, put on any one person. Yeah, and I think people in the Me Too that have been outed in the Me Too movement, the men who have been uh, found out, you know, and I think sometimes our first reactions for for the men, at least, or people that we have respected those those men Mm -hmm. wrongly, but but maybe innocently respected them not knowing is to say, oh, that's so sad that 
you know, so and so turned out to be a complete creep. And let's, a, let's just and a, say a violent it. Aggr- Louis C.K. <laughs> yeah, or somebody like yeah. It's like what a bummer that he turned out to be that guy. Right. Um, but in, in a way, he didn't deserve to be in that place. Like he lucked out and 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 didn't manage his his fame very well. So so fuck him. You know, like you know, he's he's just one guy, and there's plenty more people where he came from that are maybe even funnier or you know what i mean this is this whole fear of like oh no like how will the secular movement get along without lawrence krauss like just fine yeah just fine we'll get along just we'll we'll be fine you know like there's plenty of physicists out there who haven't gotten their shake and women physicists and you know other people that are doing really really good work uh that maybe they can step into a role where they can educate the rest of us about some things. Yeah. You know, it's not like we're going to all fall to pieces because one person, you know, Obama's not the president anymore. What will we do? Like, we'll, you know, <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah. Well, not only are we not going to fall to pieces or our lives be ruined. I think what we're seeing with Kavanaugh this last week was everybody's worried about his life being ruined. And we could say that of like, Oh, oh my God. You know, isn't it sad that Louis CK is not going to be able to be the top comedian that he was all these years or that Kavanaugh is going to have to go back to just being a state, you know, judge <laughs> or something. And uh, anyway, yeah, just it's ridiculous what we. What... Yeah, I mean, these misplaced concerns. Yeah. Um, I had friends, and, you know, I think it's not too much has changed about these particular people, but I don't know if you've had these kind of friends, but they're just crazy. They're wild. And it's not just when they're drunk, they're just really, their sense of humor is whack. And they're the type of guys, I'll tell you one story. Two friends. They're going somewhere in a car, and the third guy that's a friend of theirs, but, you know, they're just all three of them crazy, and he says, well, you know, well, can you give me a ride to such and such? And they said, only if you show me your dick. <laughs> and they, Oh, my gosh. And, and it's just funny to them. And it's three guys, so that's a little different. But, they, you know, and the guy had to show him his dick before they let him in the car. <laughs> And they're just, there's some wacko shit. And oh, I just, my word. I can see Louis C.K. being just weird enough to where he flops it out and shows it to a woman or jacks off in front of him thinking that it's funny. I don't know. But it, you know, I, I'm not trying to yeah. justify it. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, here I am mansplaining, but I'm just saying it's, it's weird and I don't know what to do with it. And we're a fucking mess. <laughs> the human race. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think that the idea is that none of us deserve like Kavanaugh does not deserve to be a Supreme Court justice. That's a privilege that's conferred upon a very, very few people with for a reason, for a reason. And it doesn't even necessarily make you a bad person to say that you're not qualified to be a Supreme Court justice. It just means you're not qualified to be a Supreme Court justice. I mean, in Kavanaugh's case, it does mean he's a bad person. But this idea that oh, I deserve to stand in front of an audience of, you know, 10,000 students at a university and spew my hatred all over the place. No, you don't. Like nobody deserves that kind of right. platform. That's right. a, that's a gift or a privilege that's given to you if you earn it or if society deems that, you know, that you have something worthwhile to say. And, and of course, you know, we do have, thankfully, uh, free speech laws in our country that allows people to say really horrible things as long as they're not threatening to hurt someone yeah. and r- riling others up to hurt people. But nobody deserves to be given a job or a platform or, or anything else. Like we deserve to be able to live and survive and have a livelihood and a roof over our heads and the basics of life. But Lucy K doesn't deserve to be a famous comedian. Yeah. I think one of the things that I've seen, it's been kind of fascinating because of how, how fast it can switch and turn. And that is these accusations of the other camp that how fragile they are or how oversensitive or snowflakey they are. And so it's typically like mm. the, the left is really fragile and easily offended or whatever. And yet I, I'm thinking of like with Kavanaugh just saying, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to be, I don't get to be the Supreme Court. I mean, it's like going to a job interview and the mm. the person across the desk says, you know, we're going to pass. <gasps> what? You know? <laughs> And it's like, no, it's my prerogative. I you don't throw think, a fit. You throw a fit when it's like, no, you don't deserve the job. Get out of my office or whatever. You know, good luck on your next, you know, try. Yeah. But this is not the end of your world, and it's not the end of mine. It's just, we're just, it's a simple no. Can you take it? 
Well, yeah, and in the case of Kavanaugh, it, it could potentially be the end of the world for you know thousands and thousands of people who will be affected by the decisions of the Supreme Court going forward. So, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's in a way, it's more troubling even than the election of Donald Trump because. We can, you know, in four years vote in somebody else, um, yep. hopefully. But, you know, and I guess in Kavanaugh's case, there is some grounds to impeach him. But I seriously doubt that the Democrats will have the stomach for that. Yeah. All right. So I meant to talk to you a long time ago in this, in, I mean, about an hour ago, about your work with uh, Secular Student Alliance and Secular Student Groups on campuses. And that's kind of your, mm. that's your new gig, right? Yeah, for a year. I've just come up on a year anniversary of starting with SSA, Secular Student Alliance, and that's what I've been doing for a year. And it feels like it's been longer than that just because it's been very um, all-consuming. You're not on a single campus, though, right? I mean, you're, you're kind of nationwide or what? Yeah, so the organization is national. Uh, we're on about 300 campuses around the country, and we – you know, manage and, and support and organize those chapters remotely over Facebook and email and video chat and all of that stuff. So we're, I have two organizers that work with me. They have responsibility for about a hundred chapters each that are sort of actively working with them. And, um, I support them in various other ways and organize the national conference and, and do special projects and, uh, new program development and project development and resource development. So yeah, yeah, the three of us manage all of that, but it's great. And plus I'm also on the USC campus as, uh, the humanist chaplain. So I have my own little laboratory there as you, as it were to kind of be immersed at a deeper level with the students and then sort of pull back and, and sort of have this national, uh, opportunity to help out as well. Cool. So you, you kind of inherited Bart Campolo's work there. That's exactly right. You know, Bart really laid the groundwork in a powerful way at USC, really took the organization that was already there called like the Atheists and Agnostics of USC or something like that. Mm-hmm. He changed the name to Secular Student Fellowship, which I think is, you know, indicative of Bart's passion and vision. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you know, which is that it's it's about fellowship. It's about community. And if you meet Bart for five minutes... Uh, you're going to know that that's the thing that he yep. cares about the most yeah. and and with good reason. And, and he's done a really fantastic job. And so that group is about, well, I just cooked Sunday dinner for them. There were about 25 students. We meet for dinner every other Sunday night and on campus there at the Office of Religious Life. And then they meet every Monday for a discussion group. And then we're hosting the national conference there this coming summer. Cool. Um, but yeah, they're a tight knit group. They love one another. They they have cool little rituals that they've developed and a real bond of friendship that they uh, are doing a decent job of extending outwards to others. You know, this is the trick of the tribalism. To use that word again, is that the um, the tight in group uh, bonds can also form sort of out group sort of walls as well. And that's a balance that you know any group has to manage. It's not it's not to say that community isn't worth it because it has these boundaries, but you have to figure out how to manage those boundaries in healthy ways, but they're doing a good job. Yeah. And you don't want to, I mean, I think one of the things that we get accused of by maybe religious people is that we're proselyting just as much as they are. <laughs> yeah. And this, this group really isn't into that. I mean, no. they sort of take, they take their atheism for granted in a way. And, you know, and again, that can also appear smug. Right. It, you know, but I like the sound I mean, of any that kind though. of, yeah, any kind of knowledge can appear smug. Like if you know things that somebody else doesn't know, they're going to think that you're totally, you know, showing them up or something. But, but it's like, it's funny how quickly my mind has changed. I meet people now, and I just kind of assume they don't believe in God. Yeah. And when I find out they do, I'm kind of like, huh, that's curious. Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. You seem I like do too. I'm making that shift. Too. Rational person. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. You seem I... like an otherwise rational person. I'm su- I'm surprised that you. So they sort of take their atheism for granted and then they just go on with the questions of, uh, well, how do we manage our fear of death and what do we do about loneliness and how do we find joy yep. and what do we what do we do with our hurt? You know, like all those you yeah. know, topics that <laughs> that a religion addresses humans regard. <laughs> yeah. Humans just have those questions no matter what ideology you have. Yeah. 
And I, I mean, I use the word pacified, and I really mean that literally, like a pacifier. That it, I feel like that I had those needs, and Jesus came along and shoved a pacifier in my mouth to shut it up, you know? And now that you take the pacifier right. out, you're, those needs are still there, and you have to find, and here again, not to sound smug, but you have to find more honest ways to find joy and give your life meaning and overcome your fear of death, et cetera. For Figure second, out how to self-soothe. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Um were you ever a youth pastor? No, I was never a youth pastor. I mean, I had youth that I worked with, but I never had that specific title. Yeah. Well, I was primarily for most of my time in ministry. It was It was with youth or whatever. But I guess in general, have you noticed anything different about what we might call the emerging <laughs> generations and whether they're X, Y, or millennials, or I don't give a shit. But just are you seeing anything as far as what might be trends in in the culture of, of teens and, and post teens? I don't know if, if I do or not. I mean, I know that they're less religious and I can definitely see that. I run into a surprising number of young adults and teens that were never religious. And I think our generation was more people who had been religious and left. Mm-hmm. I think we have more and more young people today that were never that religious to begin with. Yeah, They were perhaps in a household that they would have called religious, like there was a Bible in the house and they maybe went to church a handful of times. And if things got really bad, they might've prayed or something like that. But it was, certainly wasn't what you and I would have thought of as devoted Christians. I know that we've, we've chalked up a lot of that to just information access, like the internet. Yeah. I think that is a big part of it. Someone asked me why I thought that was happening. And I think that is a big part of it. And I also think that it's just a story running out of gas, and it, it just takes time. <laughs> I love that, but it did take 2,000 years, so that's a big gas tank. But well, I, and I think cultural, certain kinds of cultural issues, for whatever reason, and I'm not sure I understand why, the LGBTQ question mm-hmm. really has had a devastating impact on the church. Yeah. More than racism, because I think Christianity was sort of born in racism in America, so it was sort of like, Racism was more of a feature than a flaw mm-hmm. and in, in Christianity, but LGBTQ stuff, like the people, the issues, the questions around it, like all of that, you know, the church really uh, drew a line there, and understandably, because the, the Bible is um, anti-gay, um, sure. as far as I can tell. So I understand <laughs> why. <laughs> I understand why the church would have drawn that line, but that has not been kind to their – I mean, that's that's been hard on the church, and I think they've just lost people over it. And I don't think young people are particularly in the mood to try to find the silver lining around something when the teaching of it is that their good friend who's gay is going to hell. Yeah. There's no – I mean, how, how much lipstick do you have to put on that idea to make it look good? Yeah. So I think that's been – that has been a major, major issue, and all the research bears that out that of all the issues that people cite as the reason why they're estranged from religion, it's... Uh, how they handled that. How they handle gay people, yeah, gay and trans people. Yeah. For sure. So when you were saying that it's that there's no need for them to find the silver lining, that that ship has sailed or that, you know, I I've, I've, I've felt that double jeopardy again, that like we don't have to retry this or this is... And I think... <laughs> I think in the progressive, maybe even the word progressive, is that we have moved on, and some people haven't. And that is what I feel like is happening as far as, you know, I don't know if we're a giant uh, rope and the slack is taken out and then it yanks, but it catches up and people get hurt and things break. But you can hear it in the fear of the slippery slope and, and like it when if back maybe even in slavery when they were like well if we if we start letting them free you know what's going to happen right. next and or if we next start you know they're going to want to vote <laughs> yeah if we start drinking out of the same water fountains i mean and then we say i mean there honestly when i was a kid and it's not it's it's actually alive and well today but it was absolutely the zeitgeist of american especially rural where i'm from is just to completely ridicule fags, gays, faggots, you know, just, it was just absolutely the worst thing you could be. Uh, and, and it was, right. to, was to be gay, that you were twisted, you were perverted, and you were, 
just a, a deplorable thing. And so the Bible had won that generation <laughs> with its terminology. Right. And and then, you know, I think even now, uh, trans is probably an, another frontier that's going to be tough for, for people to make the transition. It's such a paradigm shift that sometimes old dogs can't learn new tricks and it's just never going to make sense and they're never going to accept it and they're never going to be able to call that person they've known as a man all their life now a woman or whatever. And these are these are tectonic right. shifts in the culture that that people are either afraid of, which is primarily the thing, or they just don't have the elasticity or the you know the flexibility to grow or stretch to use a new wineskin metaphor. <laughs> And, right. Well, and then there's that, this, like, we're, what are we going to do next? We're going to marry our dog. You know, the, that whole stupidity of the slippery slope, you know. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, just looking back to my, my own experience, which I, I realize is, you know, anecdotal and not, you know, necessarily the case generally. But I do have a feeling that pluralism, it's easier to maintain a single story about the world when yep. the people within your sphere of influence pretty much all look like you. Even something like, we talked about the internet already, but even something like the ease of air travel and, and of course, immigration and pluralism sort of writ large. I mean, people have mosques being built in their communities where they never even heard of Islam, mm -hmm. you know, 30 yeah. years ago. And, and now there's a whole community of Muslims in our community. And I think the minute you start to say, well, these Buddhists don't have a God per se, or they have a different notion of what divine means. And yet they seem like really cool people and they seem like good people. And do I really think that those people are going to hell because they don't have my religion? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, I think it's just harder to hold on to this idea that there's one path to the good life when you have so many people around you that seem to be contributing to society in positive ways, but hold radically different ideas about the ultimate and atheism the same way. The more people that are atheists who are good people and contributing positive ways to their community and raising their children and so forth, it's harder to maintain that belief system that says it's my way or the highway. And so I, I just think all of those things really do contribute to young adults today being, you know, much less uh, ideologically prone yeah. uh, in terms of religion. I don't know if it's an ism or not, but I think when I've heard white supremacists talk – if it's called separatism or something, but it's this belief that your culture is wonderful, beautiful, your gods are, are your gods, your temples are your temples, and your customs are your customs, but they just belong on your continent. Just like isolationism or, or something, like I think, and this like anti-globalist, you know, kind of mentality, and it's it's all, I think, a fear and a backlash against change, you yeah. know, as it's happening in our world, yeah. And well, are you you're familiar with Ernest Becker's denial of death? Oh yes, yes, yes. So this is the answer to me. Like this became my Bible because I have yeah. I have chosen a culture that gives my life meaning, and it feels warm and and cozy and soft and comforting for me to go. Ah, oh, I'm in the right place. I'm on the right team. I'm in the right tribe. I eat the right food. I wear the right clothes. I follow the right God. I sing the right songs. Oh, thank you. Oh, I feel so good. My fear of death is appeased. And when you build a tower, a temple, you sing a different song, you eat different food, you wear different clothes, you have different color skin, my security blanket, my security and my fear of death, that, that which was my immortality project is now threatened. And so you really are, this is, these are fighting words. I mean, you're, you cut right to the crux of my existence yeah. and I can't, I can't bear to drive by your fucking temple. Right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, because your very existence calls into question everything I hold dear. You literally reflect back to me some doubts that I can't really manage anymore with you being around yeah. me. <laughs> well, exactly. And I saw that happen to me personally. I feel like as I started into my experiment of like digging into my doubts and my questions and saying, I'm going to take a year. I don't think these questions and doubts are going to go away. So I'm going to take this year and explore them and dig into them. The anxiety that that produced in people around me was really mystifying to me at first. And it was actually someone else who was still a Christian at the time who said, 
it's forcing people to address questions that they don't want to address. <laughs> your very existence, the presence yeah. of your experiment, your project is forcing them to address things that they would prefer not to yeah. or to push you away. And, and so to, to push the questions away, they now have to also push you away. Yeah. And I thought that was really profound. I, I don't think I could have – I wouldn't have gotten there that quickly had this person not – no right, to me. and I, I I get that. I think I think that's beautiful because you kind of had this naivete of like, just literally going inside and saying, "Wow, I really need to do this, and and I want to do this for me." And I I kind of this is my little experiment, unbeknownst to you, that people are going to go, Ryan, why are you doing this to me? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They literally took it personal. Right. Yeah, they did. It was my project, but I did it publicly, and so they. They took it personally because I had represented to them. These were people that most of them that I knew personally already. Mm -hmm. So they knew me in this one way. And now I was going down this path that like really implicated them. Yeah. And I know there was others like, and I had these kind of friends that came to me and they said, dude, I love you so much. And I, I know where this is going. This is not going to end well for you. And I'm just giving you caution. I had one dear pastor friend of mine. He just said, please don't do this, you know? And I was like, I'm just, you know, trying to be honest. And I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. And I don't believe in substitutionary atonement. And I'm just wondering if there's a Jesus that can survive without those pillars underneath him, you know? Yeah, yeah, I know. And it's it's a house of cards. And, yeah, it turns out, yeah. And I think more people realize it than will say so. And yeah. I think this is like maybe the open secret in a way that that many um, religious leaders, they know that their whole project is on a sort of fragile foundation and um, they have to shore it up all the time, you know? And even if, even if somebody like you or me were not out there to try to tear apart somebody's thing deliberately, just the questions themselves do that and whether we intend it or, or not. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Our very existence. Yeah. All right. So, I've been, I've enjoyed our talk and I'm I'm encouraged about uh, the work there. I I'm currently the staff advisor to the Secular Student Alliance at the Vanderbilt campus. Yeah, and we've been very excited to have Vanderbilt back. You know, for the longest time it was sort of dormant and we couldn't quite figure out what was happening there yeah. and lately there's been a spike in activity which is super exciting because I knew that you were there but I haven't been able to give it anything in the last I mean, I've been I've been there 7 7 years as far as employed there yeah there's been so much stuff going on in my personal life and I and I live yeah. uh, 45 minutes away and so when I go home after work I, uh, or even on the weekends I don't really want to go back to campus very bad so I haven't really been any kind of sure. part of the surge. And I like what, what we're doing. And I know Tennessee has been a big, the Secular America Votes campaign has been doing really well in Tennessee. And and we've had a few of our chapters engaging around that, registering voters on campus. And we're going to switch here in a couple of days from the effort to register voters now that the deadlines are approaching mm -hmm. to more uh, get out the vote campaign. Yeah. Um, Trying to get our young people civically engaged, which is, again, a big, a big part of, the, I think, what it means to be appropriately secular. Yep. And a steward of your citizenship. Yeah. Appreciate your work out there, well, man. Thanks for talking to me. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure to pleasure to talk to you again, and let's let's catch up again soon. Well, if you're ever in this in this area, and if I'm ever out there, we'll get a beer. Absolutely. All right, Anytime. man. Talk to you later. Talk to you soon. You got bills and bouncing checks Nothing's right and nothing's left to lose But you got to lose Don't know what your future holds You're getting tired and growing older too But you got to lose You got dudes who know you better than you know yourself We'll pick you up and dust you off when you could use some help So when I wake it's heavy and you just don't know what to do Don't you worry, no, no, no Cause you got to she won't write she won't So that's my talk with Ryan Bell And he is my friend and 
I'm always intimidated to talk to smart people. And Ryan, you know, somehow I'm still intimidated, but he makes me feel okay and normal and that he's not going to think any less of me for not being able to keep up with him. Uh, but he's a good thing for the world. Uh, he's well-read, but his heart, I mean, you can hear his heart. And, you know, you have to have conviction in order to be out there and put yourself out there like Ryan does. And his convictions I look up to and I watch to see, you know, almost as a weather vane as to which way the wind's blowing, or at least the right wind, and 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 try to track with, like, how... I know we don't want to be people who say, you know, how am, I, how am I supposed to think about this and then go and sit under some guru? But, you know, at the same time, I, I do lack understanding and comprehension sometimes of the complexities of what the fuck is going on, especially in the Trump era. And I just really look to certain people for at least some guidance. At the end of the day, I'm accountable for my own thinking and my own decision making, of course, like the rest of us. But, you know, people like Ryan, and not just people like Ryan, but Ryan. Ryan himself is one of those people that you're not going to go wrong watching and taking some cues from from him. Anyway, good talk. Love him. Uh, Life after God. Very similar work to to what I do here at uh, Everyone's Agnostic, and we love and support each other's work because we're, you know, brothers of a different mother. All right, that's our show. Uh, Have a great week. Two weeks, actually. You won't hear from me for another two weeks. And uh, that's how it's going to be for a while, if, if not the rest of the duration of this show. I don't know. But I love you guys. I really mean it. Have a good week. And heads up. And I think by the time the next episode comes out, we will know how the election went. And so, I don't know. I need some kind of relief from the pins and needles that I'm that I'm emotionally sitting on as the world crumbles before our eyes. But uh, anyway, (laughs) peace out. You got bills and bouncing checks Nothing's right and nothing's left to lose But you got dues